I, my own belief is that some element of decentralization is important everywhere because I believe in that, that the fundamental social contract piece that I discussed before is heavily exhibited at the, at the local level and that there is always something that local governments can do in every country. But I do think the point that I was, that, I, that probably was not clear to you, I, I think that the, the reasons why countries adopt decentralization differs. For some, it's part of a regularized public sector reform process. For some, it's a response to a crisis. There's a political crisis. By, by creating a little bit of political credibility in a country where for decades no person had any reason to trust any level of government. And so that the, there was a lot of criticism about that because the fiscal federalism guys said finance is supposed to follow function. In Cambodia there was no functional assignment. They gave small unconditional transfers to communities to decide things that they wanted they made mistakes, and they made big mistakes. They built a lot of rural roads that washed out in the, in the, in the first rains and, and so forth. But part of the quid pro quo, they got that autonomy, but there was a dedicated effort to build basic financial management and planning systems, um, mechanisms for, for, for participation in ways that the local governments learned over time, and now are ready to accept formal assignments of functions. And this isn't relevant in large urban areas in India, although it might be, uh, it might prompt ideas about how to deal with uh, in, 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 in more um, rural areas. And so I, I think that, um, that the point, again, gets, it's really your point, diagnosing the situation, understanding the, the, uh, the realities on the ground, the political, technical uh, realities and, and needs on the ground, but also the underlying motivations for what's happening and what that implies about what is feasible in a, in a particular place. And I want to close with a cautionary tale. Um, you know, as a, as a person who for many years went around the world uh, uh, promoting this fiscal decentralization business, um, perhaps a bit mindlessly, perhaps not aware of some of the issues that I'm, that I'm raising um, with you now, I now realize um, that one has to be careful. I, I started harassing the Indonesian government 20 years ago to make the property tax a local government tax. Uh, it's a central government shared tax. They finally did it a few years ago. For the established local governments, the big urban areas that have the capacity and, and, the, and, and clear needs for the resources, it looks like it's gonna work well. But what's gonna happen in some places is they're not gonna collect it. The lo it's now a local tax, they can choose not to collect it. So, you're undermining the, the, the following the, this that property tax, given its characteristics, should be a local tax. By following that logic, I think that fiscal decentralization in Indonesia is, is being damaged. And so then the question becomes in the diagnostic point, why are some local governments not collecting it? In some cases, it's capacity. But I think it is mostly a, a, a matter of flaws of the system and governance weaknesses. Flaws in the system because the transfers are so damn big that a lot of these places don't need to incur the political cost of collecting property taxes from, from their constituents. But it's also true that in some of those same local governments, since the decentralization, service quality is declining. And why is service quality declining? Because citizens were not properly, did not properly understand what they were able, what they should have been able to demand from their local government. And there's no pressure on the demand side for doing the things that, that need to be done. 
And because the government created with a lot of donor funding, community-driven development programs that put large amounts of money around the local government system down to communities, a lot of Indonesian mayors will complain to you that everybody's engaging with the community-driven development mechanisms and not with the local governments which are elected and have the power to tax. And so just a cautionary tale in terms of how we, we think about these issues and I'll leave it at that, thank you. Forward because uh, you have said much more in your second round than you did in the first round. I know, I'm sorry. Yes, no, 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 that's, that's, that's good because no, you know, you've spelt it out. And therefore I think it's very important that we generate a dialogue around it. Uh, the first thing, you know, when you said that you have seen fiscal decentralization in several countries not going well, and this is after uh, Dr. Mohanty spelt out, as is there in his paper also, that what we really are recommending now and where we are at now is a situation where the constitution has assigned the accountability to the local government, but there is no uh, uh, funding for that mandate. So this is an incomplete mandate. And as Mr. Ramachandran said, we need to reform our state finance commissions. We need to empower our state finance commissions. As we say in our, one of the papers in the book, that uh, like South Africa, you need guaranteed predictable transfers. So there's some oxygen going through these urban local bodies. And then to say that, if I read you correctly, since you believe that, and like many others, that public-private partnerships will not work because you will not be transparent, you will not have two equal partners, you will not assign risks, and there is so much mistrust that it would not work. We are actually beginning to have PPPs that are working, very few, but they are working. But anyway, each with his prejudice, her prejudice, and, and we move forward. If you knock PPPs, if you say fiscal decentralization, if it's a slogan, it doesn't work anywhere else, then what is the message? The message is that the government of India or the state government have to actually provide finances to deal with municipal water supply and wastewater treatment. And that's what we are trying to get away from. Because what we are saying in India is you can't provide these things sitting in New Delhi what Rajkot needs or what uh, uh, you know, Tirupur needs cannot be decided. However, like a clever academic, you ended by saying, yes, get the diagnostics and then you bring everything up to a point. Nobody will disagree with that kind of truism. Of course, everybody would do, agree with that. But the real challenge that I'm throwing to the group here, and there are people who know better about these things than I do, and we are really all about defining our research agenda forward. I would like to have some people like Barjor, uh, I think Sunita is not here, uh, uh, you know, Jagan is sitting here, uh, Ritin in, uh, Ratin is sitting here. I would like them to come up with their assessment. It's a judgment, uh, but it's a better judgment than those of us who are not experts in this area. Exactly where are we at in India? Do you think that we have arrived at that level of fiscal decentralization that now recentralize? Or do you think that we've tried enough with PPP correctly that we can put it aside? And do you think that we have public funding to then finance the, the projects that we need to finance to put urban infrastructure in place and fix our governance to get service delivery done? You know, because this is really a seminar about um, getting us to think on how to push policies. And the messages that I got while they were very wise and rich in, you know, your uh, global perspective, your experience of what has happened elsewhere, you rightly shied away from taking a position. But there are others here. I want to know what their position, including Arun. So that, so that we can, and I am, even if I have uh, misphrased your question, even then it's correct because we need to provoke people to come out. 
Yeah, because I'm deliberately doing this because I want to know what the sense of the room is. And but I, Bajor has taken my bait, and Arun, then you'll have to wait after that. Thanks. Good at taking bait. Anyway, uh, let me take the perspective of two countries that I know well, Uganda and Tanzania. I, I, I led the decentralization work there uh, for the World Bank. <clears throat> In Uganda, it came out of a crisis. Um, there, was a, there was, you know, Museveni was taking over. Uh, he didn't know really how to manage the country. He was a central, it was a one-party state. And he established decentralization as a means, like in, very much like in Cambodia, to make sure that the government reaches you know, the, the la last community. And yes, there were community-driven development pro programs which were messing around with, uh, I don't personally like the community-driven development. I mean, I'm not a warm, fuzzy person. So the, what really happened was that <clears throat> for the first eight to nine years, decentralization went extremely well. So what did it do? The elements of the decentralization program in Uganda and followed that and followed in Tanzania for the fact that they had they had a formula driven so population multiplied by a total number poverty it was a poverty element and that's the per capita per, uh, per local government authority transfer on an annual basis given in four tranches which meant that the local government had a predictable they knew at the beginning of the year what they would get and to be able to be eligible for this very much like in the Indonesia LGSP that you may have known it was, uh, it was an assessment. So you failed. If you failed, you didn't get anything. If you passed, you got the grant based on, your, on the formula. Now, theoretically, what, it, what that meant is that a local government could plan its finances. But in practice, it was very different. It was very different. What happened is that the state was always uh, in a cash crunch. So they could never really transfer the amount that they had promised to transfer when they had promised to transfer. So they got all their money towards the end of the fiscal year, very much. You would recognize this in this country. And, and so therefore, they, could, they were bunching up at the end of the fiscal year. They could never finish projects. And there, were, there was no great service delivery. Now, as the country went from a single par one party state to a multi-party democracy, everything changed. Because what had happened in the first seven years was that it, this had been an incubator of local leadership. And now those local leadership, uh, the local leadership in, in Jinja or other places started to say, who the hell is this Museveni? You know? So they formed separate parties. Now when it became a multi-party state, Museveni started to pull back decentralization. Because it was not, in some, in some local governments, the opposition came to power. Now why would he fund, you know, he said, why should I give them predictable transfers? So that, that, that was one story. In, in, in Tanzania, <coughs> it had always been a one-party state under, uh, under Nirere, great pal of Nehru. And uh, when he, turned it, when he uh, left power and the new governments came, came to power, they all established a multi-party state, but essentially a one party was very strong. Again, you would recognize that in this country. They established the similar formula, formula-based transfer, and at one point, then, as the other parties became stronger, decentralization has been weakened, and there is a lot of pull to be to de, uh, to de, to re-centralize. Now, in India, I think no, now coming to India, based on those experiences, I think that the political reality of India is such that the state governments are very strong, and in the state governments, uh, we have single leaders who are very strong. It's not in their interest at this moment to decentralize their power to a whole